Okay. Okay, so today's lecture um, is, a, is, is on a topic um, which is central to agent based modeling practice. Often requires considerable thought during an agent based modeling project is absolutely key for deriving insights from that project. Adds considerably to the complexity of, of some projects. And yet is almost discussed, not at all, in, in discussions of agent-based modeling process because it's, it's kind of supportive or scaffolding uh, for the sort of core model itself. Um, what I'm talking about is what I like to term, and I think it's a term that has come up in uh, Railspec and Grimm's uh, individual and age-based modeling book. Uh, it's, it's the term observer processes. Um, and the reflection here is that commonly models have a core set of processes that are captured in the model. These are models, dynamic models. So they're capturing processes over time, processes of change, pathways of effect that we posit might represent things in the world or which we're interested in setting up as a thought experiment for, for, for you know, what, what will be the implications of processes like that. And, and a lot of our focus in our models is, is in characterizing these processes that at some level describe phenomena um, in the world or that are, you know, uh, have our sort of alternative worlds um, for, for theory building. They have to do with the kind of mechanics of, of what's going on out there, or the mechanics of interventions that affect what's going on out there. Um, and those processes have formed the bulk of, of our work together in this class. Processes associated with change of state, think about state charts. Characteristics of people, think about heterogeneity and parameter value. Interactions between agents, it's so central to agent-based modeling the interactions that give rise to this emergent behavior. Uh, processes involving spatial location, you know, context, spatial context, context in networks, and mobility, you know, mobility within the spatial environment and dynamics of networks and potentially dynamics in the environment. There's, there's other processes yet, but but these have to do with processes in the world, you know, capturing generative pathways to affect things that affect what's going on in the world in different ways. And we represent at the level of processes, you know, uh, pathways so that we can intervene, say, on them and stop them, or so we can better understand why we see certain trends. We can trace it back to certain phenomena in the world. We need to understand what's driving this. Um, and, and we can capture these kind of nested levels of context as we do in the socio-ecological model, but Brough and Brenner and others. And that's great. That's, that's kind of the focus of our model. Our thinking is in this. But then there's this supportive stuff that we need to do in order to, to accomplish the modeling. It's kind of the scaffolding. It's the kind of, supportive you know glue or or supportive elements that let the whole thing hang together and let us get insight from it and one of the most central elements are probably the single biggest need there is what are called observer processes these are things that let you know what's going on in that model so it's great if it represents these generative pathways, these causal pathways to effect. Um, 
and that they contribute to change over time. That's all great. But unless you know about it, unless you have information about what's going on in the model, it can be like the tree falls in the forest, but the tree falling in the forest that nobody hears. Um, it, uh, it's, it's not something you observe. It's not something that you're aware of, you know, these interesting patterns of emergence. The reason we, we benefit from these models is because we can learn from them. We can observe and, and see things and, and, and observe things that are unexpected and observe, for example, trade-offs between interventions or notice trends or see phenomena created by the model that match observations from the world. That's how we, we develop confidence in the models. It's how we calibrate models. That's how we, we help, help learn from them and, and help advance our thinking. But in order to do that, we need, a, we need lenses on what's going on in the model. We need eyes on what's going on in the model. We need mechanisms that will tell us what's going on in the model. Those aren't mechanisms of the world. Those are mechanisms to kind of inform us as to what's happened. Although sometimes in agent-based models, they mirror things in the world, you know, surveillance processes we might have in the world that are also simulated in the model. But at the end of the day, we need to know what's happening in the model so that we can get model outcomes, of course, that we're interested, et cetera. And these are processes that don't govern what's going on in the model. They don't shape it. They don't drive it, but they observe it. And to use a philosophical term, they're epiphenomenal. They're epiphenomena. They're not the phenomena themselves that are driving the evolution of the world, they're observations of that world. It's kind of like a God's eye view of the world, exactly what's going on in the world. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And that, that's totally neglected in, in a lot of discussions of agent-based modeling where the attention is on the, the processes that characterize things in the world. But attention, to this area of epiphenomenal processes, these observer processes, um, turns out to be, to be really valuable. So we're actually gonna be talking about collecting, outputting, and visualizing data. This shouldn't anymore uh, say inputting, visualizing data, okay? Um, and uh, I'm gonna try to hit on all those things if needed. We'll, may have to stretch into next time for, for visualization. Um, so uh, these observer processes uh, are central to our needs in seeing what's going on in the model. And they include processes that display data during model operation and processes that export data for subsequent observation. Um, and there's a special role to play and a special module of this component, this, of this lecture, uh, that's focused on visual display, visualization, that it turns out for HMAS modeling is, is super valuable and important. Um, and uh, plays a a big role in learning because of the unique ways in which humans are wired with such a strong visual cortex. Um, now, these observer processes don't come for free. Just like characterizing processes in the world that they characterize what's going on out there or what goes on when an intervention takes effect, the implementation of an intervention, these observer processes um, require mechanics in the model to implement them. You often have to, I mean, you almost invariably have to put in place mechanisms to be able to see the data. In a package like any logic, there are some exceptions. There are some things that are sort of for free that kind of come along for the ride when you use certain mechanisms. But for the most part, you need to have bits of mechanism that will collect the data you need 
to see the outcomes in which you're interested. Okay. Um, now, commonly um, within these models, perhaps the single most common need is is to sort of record. When I say record, I'm I'm actually using that in a broad sense. I'm I'm being deliberately vague here. We'll later talk about persisting some of that data, saving it away, exporting it from the model. But here I'm just talking about also tallying it up, sort of making note of it. Um, yeah, tallying it up is, is a good word. And so, you know, often we're interested in, in understanding what's the state of the model. And, and often it's a summary of it. Right? What, and compartmental modeling or stock and flow modeling would be considered a stock or a compartment sort of as a summary of model state. How many people are infected at a given time? We abstract over who it is, if it's Joe or Mary or Sue or Kim or whatever. No, we're, we're just dealing with a count of people. Um, and, you know, certain states of agents, how many are currently unemployed or how many, you know, how many are vaccinated or, or what have you. Um, and often we we do output and um, and trajectories um, uh, trajectories are often recorded for agents. That that slide was out of place. I, I apologize. Um, but uh, you know, often we are observing these things in one of three ways. Um, this is not always the case, but there are three really common patterns by which we tally things up. One is we do it periodically. So maybe every week, for example, we take note of how many infected people there are, how many new infectives, so the incident case count, how many prevalent infectives there are, how many people are, are just the count cross-sectionally right now, how many people are infected. Um, and maybe we do that every day or every week or what have you. So we, we have this kind of observer process, which you, you could argue has a certain, you know, relationship to processes in the world. You could be excused for thinking that. I, I often think that myself. So you could say, well, maybe that is a little bit characterizing things in the world. But the point is we need it for our output. So some things are recorded when an event happens. You know, um, you record a vaccination has occurred or an outbreak response immunization campaign has been initiated at this time. Um, uh, or the first exogenous infection has occurred in the population. And then some things are exported, or sorry, are tallied up at the end of the simulation time horizon. Um, I, I feel this a bit dry, so let, let's open a model. Let's open a model. We'll see some of these patterns, if we could. And, and, and we'll sort of loop back, and we'll go back and forth with models and with slides, as I often am want. Okay? So let's go, let's go get your any logics up, go get them up, and let's um, uh, get one of those models on the course site. So which one? Not this one. Um, uh, so I'd like you to download here. There's a model called, down at the bottom, ABM model with birth death version 10. Um, this is this is actually one of the this is like the granddaddy of models um, in my group. So this model has been around since uh, probably our first boot camp in, in 2012. Um, actually, it was a few years before that. I think we started fussing. But then it has some features. So let's let's go over to AnyLogic if we could. And I've actually already loaded it in, but I'll give you a moment to load it in. Okay. Um, now, uh, just, just to give you a, a sense, it's a very simple model. So we have people in sort of SIS sort of context, susceptible, infective, and, and, and uh, recovering, and, and they can recover spontaneously. They can also die. Um, uh, a person is either pregnant or non-pregnant. Um, uh, they can keep track of the number of children. There's a process of birth. Uh, so um, uh, the, uh, the individuals are linked up to their mother, to their, uh, th they keep track of their sex and ethnicities, and you have a bunch of other aspects of this. 
importantly, at any one time, you can find out uh, the agent's current age. And it actually computes that uh, based on uh, a birth time, which here is uncharacteristically, um, uh, so, so there's the time that they sort of appeared in the model. I, I'd call it birth time, but uh, I think it's to allow for people who, are, who started in the model plus some initial age. And so anytime you want it, you can get their age as a double precision variable. Um, okay, so let's, let's go run this model if we could. Um, there's a lot of cruft in here to sort of illustrate other things I'm not gonna go into. But if we run the only simulation there is, not much choice there, um, what we'll see is a landscape of individuals um, uh, with color indicating their status, susceptible versus infective, red or, or, or green. Um, and then uh, that's based on the, the sort of fill color. And then the uh, border indicates whether they're pregnant or non-pregnant. So most are non-pregnant, but a few are, are pregnant here. Um, and uh, there's connections between nodes, um, uh, child to mother and, and others. I actually don't think this red one is, is active right now. At least I'm not seeing it. Um, OK. Um, and uh, individuals you may note are being born. Uh, they are passing away here. And they're also um, engaged in a, a sort of visual change over time. And in fact, that's related to their age, okay? Um, so their size, so this would be a youngin. This would be a, you know, a, a, a young, young individual. Um, and uh, this would be uh, a venerable individual here. Um, so xiao to xiao, la to la. Um, and here's the count of infective people, okay, um, uh, over time. All of these are examples of, of observer processes supporting this, right? So, so there's got to be some mechanisms to get these guys to grow like this, to put them in space, to show these these links to have them swell as they age, to have them disappear when they die or or, or appear when they uh, come into the model to change color, indicating their status, uh, either with their edge or, or with nodes, and an account of people over time. And in fact, what you'd find is there's moreover a mechanism here that the model can save things. If you were to go look at the the parameters of the simulation, there's even something where you can enable output to files and it'll write out the number of people uh, who are infected over time, for example. Um, now, uh, if we go over here to the left, you can actually see a built-in sort of any logic bit of support for for uh, keeping track of data. It's called the data set. And if you click on it, you can see over time a count of infectives. Um, so here, periodically, we were reporting summary statistics. Uh, this is, I believe, every day. We could we could easily check, but you can um, you could see, you know, a count of of infectives being be, uh, changing over time here. You can also copy this with this mechanism, and you could paste it into a, um, you know, an Excel sheet. Or hey, there we go. Okay, how about this one? Um, this wasn't what this was meant for, and I'll have to remediate it afterwards. But I will go, you know, paste it in, and and now we're off to the races. We've we've exported data from the model on the count of infectives, and. You know, I'd rather do it in, in R or some other nicer package, but I could create a, you know, a chart for this, which shows, you know, the, the count infective over time. Um, okay, so um, I'll get rid of this. Uh, yes, uh, delete the sheet. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so this is a model that 
uh, has a lot of observer processes. There's processes needed to tabulate this data or to, to tally it up. There's processes needed to change the color, to communicate things. Processes needed to update this graph. Uh, there's processes needed to, to place a young and near its mother uh, and connect it up, et cetera. Um, uh, actually, I wouldn't, I would say just visually placing it near the mother. Uh, uh, and actually that's not a fee phenomenal because that ends up impacting how else they're, they're connected. But uh, certainly their visual size is, is a fee phenomenal. It's just a display of it. Um, and there's some mechanisms to output data, say at the end time. Um, okay, so uh, here we have um, uh, a, a model that has a set of observer processes associated with it. Um, and you can recently ask, well, how much data should I export from these models? Well, you know, uploading more data can gives you the option of securing additional insight. It, it means after the run is completed, you still have the option of reflecting on what the results were and, and analyzing it and, and finding patterns that you didn't recognize earlier. Um, and you can avoid the need to rerun the model to collect things at that time. Um, uh, you know, but, you know, it does require uh, it does require uh, extra burden, or it does impose extra burden. Um, so, best practices are to separate exploratory runs from production runs. So, distinguish whether you're doing this to kind of observe what's going on and kind of make sure the model looks like it's operating correctly and puzzle through why you're seeing some sorts of patterns. Uh, check that it's seems to be operating uh well versus if you want to do production level runs with larger populations say for a paper where you're really not interested in observing it while it's running i'll come back to that point um and you know most of the time with uh with models for production runs we then produce most figures after the fact now when you are exporting data, and I, I really should separate this here. This is really now about export, uh, this particular slide. Be sure to, to capture something about the model version um, and something about the assumptions that went into it, such as the parameter values. We have built tools which will further automatically record, for example, the random number speed, random number seed. But keeping track of this information is really important for being able to reproduce what's exported. Because if you don't know what version the model was used to produce it or what the parameter assumptions were, you're not gonna be able to reproduce it, uh, generally speaking. And that can cause big trouble, or at least it will cause you know, a lot of unnecessary uh, angst at work. Um, so I mentioned this, this balance and, and um, okay, I'm not, uh, it's kind of, yeah, okay. Um, so what outputs will you make? Well, often there are certain outputs for assessing scenario outcomes. So look, you're gonna be running scenarios for certain outcomes of interest. So you need mechanisms that will collect those outcomes of interest. If you're interested in the cumulative number of deaths that have occurred and, and you know, lessening it through appropriate non-pharmaceutical interventions for COVID. You, in your model, you want to record deaths um, and you want to tally them up. And so I have a total over time. Um, if your interest is in um, reporting hospitalization load, um, you know, how many, what, what, what capacity hospitals are at at any one time, you're gonna need output processes, observer processes that collect that data from the model, that observe it. And so maybe every day you keep track of the census of people in the hospital and the hospital wards and ICU, and you report the fraction of the ICU and, and, the, and the wards um, that are full with COVID-19 patients or something like that. Um, 
Now, uh, often you're further interested in comparing output data with empirical data. Maybe you want to calibrate the model. You want to tune the parameters to best align it with data from the world. Or maybe you want to just develop confidence about it. And your stakeholders need you to show that the model's not a total disconnection from the world, that it, they want to see that it, it's outputting results that look reasonable. So often, you know, we need to collect the, that information from the model. The key point here is it's epiphenomenal, right? It's, we're collecting this to use, but it's not affecting the model that we are collecting. It's kind of like a dead end process. It, it just collects it in to, for export. Um, often we moreover compute intermediate quantities um, to understand why we see the model's results. These are types of quantities where we rarely have uh, observed empirical data, but we want to understand what they're telling us about the model so that we can understand the data. So maybe we don't have very good data on asymptomatic populations, maybe in the in the model, undiagnosed populations. But to explain why we're seeing this rise in the number of hospitalizations um, or the rise in the number of reported cases, um, despite you know high levels of effort in um, contact tracing, focusing on symptomatics, maybe we want to know, hey, are there lots of asymptomatic people out there? Because we're only contact tracing and bringing people in for testing if they're symptomatic, and we're only tracing those who are symptomatic, maybe we're missing the biggest group who are asymptomatic and, uh, you know, of undiagnosed people, biggest group of undiagnosed people. So there you might want to make sure you output undiagnosed people, not because there's data from the world to compare it with. It's because there's not data from the world to compare it with in a way. We want to understand it in a way that we don't have the option of doing that in the world. We we want to use it to see the situation with a special clarity, what drives what in this model, why we might see current rise. You can actually see in the model perhaps, oh, asymptomatics could drive that rise, you know, um, and, and that's very helpful. So often we end up outputting things that we don't have data from the world. This is a common confusion on um, for those who work with statistical models using just observables. Um, you know, they or or more familiar with descriptive stats, they see something and they say, wait, we don't have data on that. Why is that? Why? Why are you outputting that? We don't have data on it. Well, yes, we're outputting it because it can help explain why we see the patterns with respect to the variables we do have data for, because this can help drive that, for example. It can help us understand why we're seeing these trends, these latent factors. Bayesians understand that with you know Bayesian latent models, but, but for people who are only deal with empirical data, it often takes uh, opening their mind to sort of uh, to the fact that you can get a lot of insight by looking at a model's representation of latent factors. Um, and then finally, visualizations. And I'm going to spend a special time on visualization because uh, for age based modeling, I see it as a key to much learning. Um, so HMA's models have representation of individual agents. In the HMA's model, you have agents that represent the synthetic population. And there's an agent for each, say, person. Let's say Sue, Mary, Sam, whatever, right? Um, but often we output data not about whether Sue is sick or not, whether Mary you know, it has severe outcomes. But we output data that's at a higher level. I'm not saying only data. Maybe we're interested in individual statistics about people's trajectories, you know, how many times people have gotten infected. But even there, we, we sort of summarize it over a population, I think, even though the 
characteristic is based on you know the journey of an individual person, how many people time they've been to the SDI clinic or how many times they've been reported as a COVID-19 case. But a lot of the time, what we're doing is we're reporting counts, like counts of people who are, who are infected or counts of people who are asymptomatically infected, uh, counts of people who are recovered. That is not an abdication of the value of agent-based models. No, it just helps us think through what's going on at multiple levels. And we don't have to see all the details. Sometimes it helps to pop up from the forest, to, from the trees to see the forest and see what's going on. Of course, the mechanics of it, the pathways are at an individual level, or many of them are at an individual level, but we often gain benefit from thinking in terms of stocks and flows, for example. Um, how many people in the past week have gotten infected? And abstract the over if it's Sam or Sue or Mary. Of course, in the model, it matters, right? Um, if Sam is at the hub of a network, it really matters that Sam who got infected rather than, you know, uh, Sue. But, but the point is, it's a useful way to think about the situation at an abstract level to be able to able to think as well about you know these aggregated quantities and how many people have gotten infected in the last week. Of course, you could stratify it in any way you want based on that it's an agent-based model. You could break it down by degree centrality of each person. Um, of the people with lots and lots of connections, what fraction of them are infected? Or of the people with few connections, what fraction of them are infected? The people at the hub of the network What's their prevalence of infection? And that's one of the advantages of agent-based model. You can break it down, slice and dice the data in any way you want. Okay, I'm not gonna comment on accumulating flow statistics. I have a lot of slides in here for those who are interested in using output with any logic it provides extra, extra information. And I'm not gonna go into this so that I can cover some conceptual material. Uh, I have, shown, for example, how you can click on specific things and see values. And um, you can even do this with variables, for example, um, uh, in, in some, of these, um, some of these models. So if we had variables in this model representing, say, the cumulative number of people infected, uh, I don't have it here, but we could click on it and we could actually do a graph of it, for example. Um, and and see you know how it changes over time. We saw this paste to get to Excel. Um, and uh, statistics and charts down here. You notice there's another little uh, um, copy thing here, and you could export it uh, and and perform further further analysis on this. Um, so any logic does provide some. Some very good support for collecting this sort of information declaratively, and basically saying plot this certain thing out over time, or collect in a data set this certain quantity, and and record it. And you'll find the models I've provided you are full of full of things like that. Um, yeah. So in general, for populations here, we also commonly have. Um, what are called statistics. So we have, you know, a count of people who are in the First Nations population, or a oh, sorry, um, a count of people who are who are currently infected, or what have you. Um, this is not where I had planned to be, but it, you can also go down to level of a person, and for example, uh, see characteristics uh, for that person. Okay. Um, Okay, um, I'm gonna actually stop that model to avoid the distraction. Uh, and I, I provide some guidance um, uh, with, uh, with some ways that you can build up these things here that I'm not gonna go into, but I will explore probably in our session together for those interested in attending. Um, I had mentioned these data sets, you can copy from them um, and uh, this is all, all, all good. Um, it's easy to output things in most agent-based modeling frameworks to something called the console, which will sort of report on what's going on. You can see it here for this run that we performed, for example. 
where it was reporting on events, the birth of a baby, um, or or you know mortality events. Um, but it was also reporting on you know the number of senior citizens, uh, and breakdown of the population by ethnicity and male versus female, et cetera, um, within the model. Um, most frameworks also provide a way of exporting data to files, and um, it's simple to perform. You can then import it easily into other frameworks. Um, you can archive these, make sure you save information on what version of the model was they were used with, what parameters were used, maybe a uh, random number seed. Um, but it can, uh, the mechanics of it, and, and it can be a bit awkward uh, to do. And I provide some mechanisms for this. I'll provide some description of how to do this in any logic. Another option that is used by some database models is export to databases. This is more flexible. Um, you can query for diverse analysis. You can clean up. You can delete runs that are no longer relevant, maybe because a defect has been discovered in the model. And so they're kind of tainted because they were created using a, uh, a model that had a problem with it, a, a, an implementation error. Um, and uh, they tend to be very flexible, but you know, there's programming involved. Uh, you know, commonly these require SQL to query them, for example, the, uh, the uh, structured query language, which is routinely used with relational databases. Um, AnyLogic does have an internal database, which I tend not to make heavy use of, but some models make, make use of uh, and, uh, and can be used to sort of declaratively record certain types of information during, during a model simulation. Um, I'm not going to go into this here in preference for covering some more conceptual stuff. Um, if you are exporting to a database and if you're exporting to files, just make sure you maintain metadata. I encourage also uh, including information on the purpose of a run, like why are you running this? What a short description of what the significance is of this run will help you interpret the results at a higher level beyond the parameter settings of model versions. Um, and just be aware that when it comes to writing to a database, when it comes to writing to a file, when it comes to doing visualization, when it comes to, to putting out output, it's not for free. Often it imposes high additional costs beyond the cost of the simulation. So I mentioned earlier, models have many types of processes. Most that we talk about in age-based model and papers and so on are processes that characterize things in the world. But these observer processes ha can have big costs associated with them. They can also encrupt code. They can also make the model more complicated in today's frameworks. We're working to, to simplify that in our methodological work, but it's the current the current context is it, it 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 tends to be tangled with the rest of it. Okay, um, I'm not going to go through. I want to talk about visualization. Visualization was a side of HMAS modeling that um, I didn't always uh, give. I didn't always lend due justice. Um, so, HMAS models. Um, have a lot of moving parts. It's a lot going on in the model. Often our interests are in higher level things, how many people have gotten infected, but we depict low level details to capture salient factors, heterogeneity, I mean, clustering and, and aspects of homophily that lead vulnerable people to spend time with vulnerable people and and you know, we capture effects of networks and spatial constraints, et cetera. There's a lot going on there. And it turns out that we have a huge asset for understanding what's going on in these models. Sometimes understanding what's going on in an HBase model can be challenging. If it outputs data as 
tabular data of a numeric sort, it can be mind numbing to go through these columns of data, rows after rows after rows of sort of summaries. It's hard to pop up and say, what does this mean? In human terms, what's going on here? What's really happening? But it turns out we have a huge asset that can help in this task if we are, are flexible in how we pursue our models. And that asset is our human brain, our, our visual cortex. Humans have amazing abilities to recognize complex patterns and to zero in on complex patterns that they see visually. And these sides of the human brain tend not to be well exercised by tabular numeric data output. You know, there's, there's something lost when you see a column of numbers compared to seeing a graph of it over time, for example. There's something lost when you see an adjacency matrix as one and zero, extending thousands of rows and thousands of columns in this symmetric way, compared to seeing a visualization of the network graph. There's something lost when you just have row after row of reports on the count of people and different grid squares that are that are. Uh, infected versus seeing a visualization of it with a heat map in, in geography. And the human visual cortex is, is a huge asset. And it turns out to be really nicely matched to, to what comes out of agent-based models. So commonly in agent-based models, we have these complex emergent patterns over time, over space, over networks. And the patterns are 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 rich, complex, and hard to see if you're just dealing with cacophony of numbers. They're much easier to see visually if they're rendered in the right way. And visualization can allow for reflecting on aspects of these model emergent behaviors. Um, and you know, a good visualization can allow you to recognize patterns, notable patterns in model dynamics, it can also allow you to spot problems, factors, say like faster, you say like, that doesn't make sense. Maybe you could have eventually gotten there by pouring over columns of numbers, but you can get there a lot faster often by seeing a visualization of it. And by, by comparing visualization for one baseline case with an intervention, it may say, oh, that's what the effect is in a way that would have been hard to, harder to see otherwise. You get a richer picture. And you can communicate with stakeholders. And often stakeholders love good visualization. Um, now, visualization plays to our strength. It plays to our ability to learn from complex visual patterns. But, there's really two big choices here, each with weighty trade-offs. You can produce these visualizations during model operation while the model is running. We saw that, right? Those growing circles, the chart being produced. We saw agents turning red and then turning green again. We saw those who were pregnant, and then a baby born nearby, and so on. Um, we can create these visualizations during model operation to support our parsing of what's going on over time. But it has cost. It has a real cost in terms of slower simulation. It really slows things out, maybe by a factor of several times. Um, Maybe your model will run twice as slow or three times. It will take twice as long to complete or three times as long to complete or something along those lines. Not always, but it, but it can if, you, if you're really heavy. And, and it can be more than that if it's, if it's very heavy duty. On the other hand, you could do this sort of visualization post-production. In other words, after the model run is finished. Um, but that also has 
you know, trade-offs. Uh, it has po uh, positives and it has negatives. Um, you can do it in your preferred visualization software. You know, you can do it with the amazing charting available with with Python or with R or with Tableau or or pick your pick your choice. Um, uh, but it does require exporting the requisite data, right? And you can produce kind of live pictures of it. And we have visualizations of the spread of Tasmanian facial tumor disease, for example, across Tasmania, um, uh, or the effects of interventions to fight that disease uh, through, through appropriate uh, baited traps to, uh, to, to be able to, uh, to, to fight uh, devil tumor facial disease and even drive it extinct as a good chance, but but it requires some mechanisms to to make it live to kind of do uh, 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 animation of it. Doing it during model operation can really aid deeper understanding of drivers and you know of currently observed dynamics. What's going on right now? So for exploratory work, this could be really attractive. Um. Spotting, you know, problems. As I said, uh, you can see an integrated animation of results. It aids in storytelling because it has some suspense. What's going to happen? And you can even make an interactive by undertaking an intervention now, for example. Um, and some of our stakeholders have been captivated with that, laboring through much of the night. You know. Uh, it, triggering interventions with a model and seeing what the results are, just fascinated by it. Um, but it does have a cost of slower simulations. And, and generally, I and really that slide about separating exploratory runs from production runs becomes very key here, because if you can do these for the exploratory runs, but eschew the simulation, don't do this over the visualization, don't do the visualization during during the production run says best. Okay, um, we've seen the ABM model for death. I'm not gonna open it up again, but um, we're gonna see a, a set of models here, okay, in, in succession. That's gonna be the first of them. Um, uh, you know, some ideas for visualization are model summaries, you know, summarize the count of people are in different states, uh, for example. Uh, sometimes we've actually created a, a compartmental diagram, a stock flow diagram, and actually, you know, used use sort of a visualization of how many, how many people in the model as agents are in each of these states, what's one of the rates of flow as a summary of the model. Scatter plots. This uh, these are one of my favorites. Uh, each person is a data point in the scatter plot. Uh, and uh, you can you could see them play out. I'll 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 jump forward. Um, for example, this is a scatter plot showing, um, uh, showing for those uh, who have uh, accessibility to the addictions recovery community health uh, program, and for those for whom it's not available, sort of here at the at the top, and uh, the the y axis. So the x axis is time since the, the, that they've uh, been in homelessness. And the y-axis is, uh, excuse me, the y-axis is percent of the time they've been homeless. And the x-axis is uh, the time since the model start. And you actually see these, these sort of draw apart over time, for example, in ways that uh, lead to, to separation under different scenarios. Sorry, this one on the left is, Total time and addiction, sort of that they've they've been uh, uh, caught up in in, in uh, substance dependency. So here we can actually see live scatter plots, kind of separation of groups over time, for example, uh, or um, or merging of groups depending on on characteristics. Uh, another example of a scatter plot would be something. Let's let's open this one up. Well. Um, maybe, maybe I won't, but this one is one of the the ones that I provided you. This GIS food and PA environment with scatter plots. It takes a bit of time to initialize uh, at a population level. 
uh, worthy to, to show these, to, to get these statistics growing. But here, each data point is a person. And the X coordinate is the fraction of meals that person eats based on convenience store fare. And the Y axis uh, is associated with their weight in kilograms. Um, and here you see a relationship that is not quite linear, but it's, it's uh, pretty close to being sort of a linear uh, curve there um, with some, some noise. Or here, you know, based on their preference of meals from convenience stores, if given a choice versus their weight in kilograms or their relative distance to a convenience store versus the grocery store. So further out you go in this, like a grocery store is six times as far as the nearest convenience store, four times as far as the nearest convenience store. And here, this is each dot here is actually a person over time. So it's it's actually multiple observations from a person, I think, for this right one. But here you see um, see their weight as well. So these plots are really useful, and you can see them evolve over time when they're refreshed in the ways that reflect the effect of intervention, for example, or, or the outcomes of some processes. Um, so scatter plots are, are very valuable. GIS visualization. This is from a model weight is contributed um, in um, Yellow Quail First Nations, for example, showing showing people in a landscape um, uh, and with roads being blocked by flooding events uh, and uh, people being unable to get, for example, to a dialysis facility or potentially kids being unable to get to schools. There's schools illustrated here as well as workplaces and homes, et cetera. Um, cultural sites uh, and uh, water treatment plant, et cetera. And uh, this is to kind of visualize the effects of different scenarios on spread of illness, but also effects on other types of illness, uh, not just waterborne illness, but things like uh, chronic disease due to inability to secure care. Um, here we have output from a pertussis model. This is uh, a Pertussis model focused on um, ORI, on uh, a uh, outbreak response immunization campaigns. And, um, and basically it focuses on this idea of undertaking immunization in a focused environment, say a school, where outbreaks have occurred in kids of a certain age. So, Often those outbreaks are are uh, maintained, and are, are, you know the the vulnerability to them reflects low vaccination rates, and therefore they can stay circulating easily and pop up due to low vaccination. And so, taking advantage of the fact that parents often are very concerned about kids' health when there's an outbreak, often that will motivate parents to opt into vaccination who otherwise would. So you can go in and get, get kids vaccinated. Um, and what you see here is a um, artful use of space where for different age groups, you have different summaries of sort of their immunological characteristics, their, their epi curves, the count of infections over time, for example, both yearly and monthly. Um, and again, this is a breakdown for the agents of that age group of how many are, are fully susceptible or partly susceptible or protected um, or, or are weakly infected, et cetera. Up here, you see sort of, uh, uh, I believe it's uh, uh, some, some distributions of her age, for example, and a set of other outputs uh, uh, further up. So this, this interface is available when you run a model. And you can kind of get a cockpit view of what's going on in the model world over time with different age groups. And uh, there's a version of that, and I, I think it may be with this button here in the middle, that you can actually choose to intervene on a certain age group now with outbreak response immunization and see how it plays out. 
So this is using interactive features with visualization. Um, this is in any logic with pie charts and, and these various types of line, line charts, et cetera. Um, uh, so here's another, uh, another output from this model with, for example, uh, stacked, uh, stacked charts indicating you know, the breakdown of the population by health status with respect to waterborne illness, as well as um, needs for other types of, um, of treatment at, at nursing stations. Um, one thing that Wade did here that uh, I really liked was um, to allow storytelling with this model. You don't, I don't really think of this uh, perhaps traditionally as, as a common form of visualization, but the point is it's live output from the model that is compelling. You know, a person's story, a person's narrative over time. Um, so, you know, they, uh, they were exposed to, uh, to a waterborne illness, they contracted uh, illness, they, they, you know, uh, went about some days, but then they headed to the nursing station for treatment of their illness, and, uh, and uh, they were successfully treated um, for that. So this, this is a storytelling mechanism output by the model. Um, this is uh, a stylized face. Uh, this is actually with the outbreak response immunization model, I believe, showing people of different ages and different levels of protection in a stylized urban area here in the center with higher density connections and a lower density periphery. But once again, this is a visualization, right? And so over time, these nodes would evolve and you'd see kind of an outbreak sweeping through um, spatially. Uh, this from uh, Eric and Michael's trucker model that they're working on. Um, and so here we have truckers moving across, uh, across the US, um, stopping at truck stops, um, which expose said truckers to um, to meals of varying meals and food of varying degrees of nutritiousness, um, with uh, not all of the meals being um, healthy for them, but but some being better than others, and and the concern is for for trucker health. And so over time, you see the trucks moving around and and coming to certain stations, and you can get. Uh, output associated with uh, the sort of health health of the trucker. Um, I believe these these small dots here are associated with truck uh, truck stops, for example. Um, yeah, can can you hear me, Nate? Yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah. So the small, I think I'm colorblind. The little red uh, warehouse looking things are basically like their shippers and yeah. their um, destinations, and then their size based on. The population of that city so we're trying to weigh it trying to figure out their routes and weighing it based on the population size assuming that the larger okay. cities will go to more likely yeah that's really helpful thanks uh so so this is a model where you can visually get a sense of patterns of movement and exposure and use of of different environments um the the um, uh, the model which I had mentioned earlier, producing these scatter plots, also has a GIS outcome associated with it, which you can run. And if you run it with a larger population, uh, for example, uh, you what you will see is um, induced uh, dynamics um, reflected in associated with weight reflected in the size of the sort of weevil-like creatures. And so these are people with a home. You can't really see their head right here because they're at home. It's maybe the evening right now or what have you. But um, but their girth is a reflection of, uh, of their weight. And um, they're surrounded by parks shown in these sort of uh, green squares as well as uh, Supermarkets shown in these, so fresh fruit and vegetable markets shown in these uh, 
and these yellow um, uh, building-like uh, contraptions, as well as uh, convenience stores shown in, in green there. And over time, people are moving around to these, but, but what's notable is that there's visual output associated with sort of health status of an individual in, in terms of their weight dynamics, and it's dynamic. And you can see it over time and, and look for patterns in areas that are comparatively food deserts. And I won't, I won't dwell on it now, but you'll notice that in this upper right, for example, um, we tend to have more people who are making use of convenience store food and, and tend to have somewhat larger uh, girth. Um, because uh, they're not near a, a convenience store. Uh, these ones down here, sorry, not near a fresh fruit and vegetable market. These ones down here are closer to a grocery store than they are to a, a, a convenience store and, and uh, their, their weight tends to be somewhat lower. So um, uh, model visualizations, you know, laid atop GIS can sometimes be be fruitful. Um, sometimes the visualizations, though, aren't in a sort of concrete physical space. They're rather uh, arrangements that use creative coloration and labeling to communicate features of this. So this, this is a model which I provide you. It's called anemia and agents. Uh, it's not a, I'll, I'll correct that. It's not an any logic sample model. I, I noticed just before class that a bunch of them are mislabeled any logic models. No, no, no. These models I've provided, but here we have dialysis patients and dialysis patients uh, have a set of complex medication needs. In this case, um, what we're looking at is needs associated with uh, what's sometimes termed uh, in the vernacular EPO or uh, epipoetin, which, um, is used uh, to help um, in the management of anemia for these patients. And uh, you'll notice that some patients here um, have higher levels uh, associated with, uh, with their presumably um, uh, their, their blood cell counts, for example, whereas some, and so this would be green up here, but some have uh, have lower levels, and um, and uh, the color is an indication of uh, a points of concern for for this given patient. These patients are managed by a set of physicians who are down here on on the the lower part of the screen, and some physicians. The basic deal is if if uh, a given physician's patients are thriving, that physician will often be uh, less strung out hour-wise. They'll be able to deliver actually better care on a per patient basis um, because the patients, there's fewer fires to fight. And so they can focus on just getting the basic details right and managing each patient uh, in a very considered uh, careful uh, 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 and and straightforward well, well and and um, thoughtful way. But if if a patient, if a set of patients associated with a given physician are having trouble, often they'll be engaged in firefighting, which prevents them from taking the time to very carefully manage other patients. And there's a vicious cycle that that develops where. You know they're they're too busy bailing to plug the hole. They're too busy fighting fires to prevent fires from happening. They're too busy dealing with the most urgent things to deal with the things that are important but not as urgent. However you want to cut it, the basic deal is that there's uh, this coupling between how patients do and how their physicians do. In a model like this can bring this out, um, this is kind of a summary view. And I may have the, the details of the polarity with the, uh, with the levels and the, the labeling wrong here, but over time you also get 
summaries, for example, of, of patient control and hours required per assigned patients um, of, for a physician and prescribing utilization um, within, within this model. This model from uh, Jim Rogers, uh, Jeff McDonald, uh, my student at the time, Dylan Knowles, and, uh, and, pr and produced in a boot camp in incubator that we ran. So um, other models look at networks and you know try to perform visualization in networks. And at a glance, for example, if you were to know that the red are recovered individuals and the green are susceptible, you can glance at this and see that individuals in crowded areas of the network, which happen to be lower SES individuals here, individuals in lower socioeconomic status, um, have, have had a much higher attack rate, a much higher burden of illness than those who are people of means over here at the right, who have comparatively fewer um, instances of infection. Now, we could go into this more about the network structure, and clearly a lot of it reflects the fact there are different components. These components right now aren't even connected with these. But the, the bigger point for visualization is that depicting visually a network is often incredibly helpful for just representing it as a matrix of ones and zeros about who's connected with whom. Laying it out and using color, potentially size, shape, to indicate the features of those in the network can communicate a huge amount of information. In the field of social network analysis, um, which is kind of cognate to agent-based modeling, but often involves very detailed analysis of network structure and some of network dynamics, um, you know, really plays to the strength of visual depictions of networks using attributes visually that bring out features of the situation. And if you're building an agent-based model, it behooves you to, to take advantage of these things. This is not merely eye candy. It's not merely you know, sort of a nice prettification of the model that that really doesn't get you anywhere. No, often this will clue you in to issues with the model, to insights from the model that you otherwise might not have had. And that's important because models are learning tools. Yeah, question. Behavior and model and behavior agent. That's right. So, so the question was: so when we talk about visualization here, on um, what is meant? And yes, uh, as you suggested, it's a depiction of model behavior and structures in the model. So things like networks, for example, and context in the model, visually, graphically commonly in a way that communicates the state and characteristics of that of that model that has run or is running right now. It's sort of a, a visual graphical summary of, of what's going on now in the model that picks out certain details. It's not always just a high level summary. You know, here we have depictions of particular people, right? But it will often show, and, and same thing, you know, here we were dealing with particular people being plotted out. But it's a summary in the sense that we're not specifying all their attributes, right? This is a projection down into two dimensions of what's a much higher dimensional space. You know, on here, we're not summarizing how many items are there in their larder from convenience stores or, or grocery stores? We're not summarizing the number of times they've been to a convenience store in the last day. We're not summarizing you know, aspects of where they live. We're abstracting away from certain details and pulling out other ones in a visual way that kind of gives us a high level picture of what's going on. And it's an abstract, characterization, not always aggregating, but sometimes projecting down certain information separately from others. And 
the value of this is, you know, by artfully picking these things, you can capture at a glance large amounts of understanding of important patterns. And patterns are central to um, the emergent the emergent uh, phenomena that we're often interested in with these with these uh, systems in the world and with models capturing. Um, so I did want to show you wandering elephants. And this is actually an honest to goodness any logic sample model. And you've seen it before in the context of GIS, but let's go let's go look at it. Um, so example models, and I know we're we're getting uh, to time here, but if we go to wandering elephants, it's down here in example models. Okay, is this the one that had, oh gosh, this is the one that had problems before, I think. Okay, well. Exactly, this is the one that, that, that caused difficulties. But I think some people were able to open it. And, okay, if you can open it, um, quite a bummer here, but if you can open it um, and run it, what you will find is there's a an interface which depicts a kind of geographic like depiction of the situation, but there'll be two choices. And this is what I want to highlight. There'll be a choice of um, of showing elevation on the one hand versus showing uh, a, a picture of what's going on right now in terms of landscape dynamics, how many um, sort of the, 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 the extent of the vegetation and, and that and where the elephants are, et cetera. Um, that model is very useful for switching back and forth between the two. And indeed, an important class of visualization tools will allow a user to select which lens they want to use. You actually saw it here. Like they can they can choose what what lens do they want to apply right now um, to this model. And some some people may want to use one lens versus another. Um, uh, here's here's another example from any logic of, of a trauma center, also making artful use of representation, showing people seeking care within an environment. And we saw early on some aspects of spatial dynamics in a 2D space, where once again, the visualization was really key. And here for our chronic wasting disease model with prion deposition and circulation of, of deer uh, engaging in, um, in, in uh, water seeking behavior, capturing at once, depictions of density of prions, um, uh, the, the sort of uh, levels of, uh, of uh, or the types of, of landscape um, components here. Uh, I think this is in the winter, so it's, it's mostly snow, snow covered. I think this is something to do with uh, probably elevation. But down here, what we see is a depiction of the population of different groups. So these are conceptually the stocks, the, the uh, conceptually the classifications of the underlying agents, clinical status, subclinical, um, uh, but shedding, shedding prions, subclinical non-shedding and susceptible. Um, and here, you know, we have them placed uh, in a landscape and what it brings out is concentration of prions, for example. I had for years worked with chronic wasting disease models that were compartmental in nature. And when I saw this, I immediately knew it was a game changer, like in terms of our understanding of, of prions and prion exposure. So, you know, I've given here some ideas for visualizations. Uh, I've shown GIS visualization, state chart, network visualization. Um, model summaries. Uh, I haven't really shown 2D histograms uh, 
but those can be used to kind of summary, summarize when you have many, many types of data, the sort of a density plot for the population of, of, of the number of people that fall in certain sort of ranges with respect to two characteristics, if, if you have a 2D histogram. Box plots are another great way of summarizing. With an age-based model, again, we can summarize in any number of different ways because we have individual agents. We're not beholden to the particular breakdown used in simulating the model, you know, that we have these stocks only with these, you know, sex breakdown only. No, we, we can aggregate up and summarize in many different ways. And, you know, classic, um, uh, classic mechanisms for summary statistics, uh, box plots, uh, line plots, uh, histograms, cumulative distribution, pie charts. These are all really useful constructs for summarizing. And soon we'll be seeing, have a lecture on uh, state space uh, characterizations. Um, I put here some scatter plot ideas. Uh, those are illustrated in some of the scatter plots I showed to you, um, you know, where you can have time sense, they were enrolled in the ARCH program, for example, or since they're intervened upon in some aspect of state, or maybe the horizontal view, you want a parameter or some function of parameters like ratio of distance between a uh, grocery store and the ne nearest grocery store and the nearest convenience store, and the vertical, some aspect of state like weight, or maybe you have some horizontal aspect of their state. Uh, maybe you know, the some component associated with the number of pack years they've smoked versus the fraction of, of those with those pack years uh, who have um, uh, who, the number of uh, comorbid conditions that they have. Maybe. Um, uh, and you can use color in these scatter plots, uh, visual size, if, if you have the flexibility, not in any logic, but make the, the markers bigger or smaller or, or shape them accordingly um, uh, to, to really bring out features or borders around the fill color versus the borders around them. Not all of these can be done in any logic scatter plots, but colors can be to a degree if you stratify it to different data sets. Um, okay, I think that's all for, for, for today. The long and short of it is uh, when it comes to visualization, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop any logic here. Um, uh, when it comes to visualization, um, uh, the human visual cortex is a key asset. Um, uh, Asia-based models often have many many moving parts that can be depicted visually to good effect. And with such visual depictions, we can often make out patterns we wouldn't make out otherwise. Okay, so that's all for today. I will see many of you in the coming tutorial section. Um, and remember to submit extra requests for topics to cover. Um, and I'll do my best to kind of navigate High, high request things. Right now, we only have something on the order of five to seven. So see if you can submit more. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to continue to meet with teams, including right now for office hours. Thank you.